This man is um, um, an end times minister, a prophet, seer of God. He sees the Lord every day. I mean, just every day, maybe sometimes two, three times angels come, take him with him. You can see the angels when he's speaking. And he's he's the he's an end times uh, prophet. He sits on the council of Abraham in heaven, literally. He gets translated to heaven, and he gets to sit in and all on the, on all the meetings. First time that he was before the council of Abraham, which had Jeremiah, um, Enoch, Paul, um, Noah, Moses. You know, he, he was in the room, and it's, 20, it's, the, it's, a tw it's the 24 elders is what it is, and Jacob, Isaac, and um, they were making the decisions on um, who's going to be the next president, and um, the Lord, he brings a file into the room, sets it on the table, it's like a round table, and they have to go through the file and make decisions, And it, but this final decision is the Lord's, always, and so he's on this council, and he gets to sit in and listen. And, um, yeah, he gets to ask questions and, and stuff. And, um, so, um, his, his name is Sundar and, uh, he, um, is, uh, teaching us about how to survive in these, these end times, these last days, because it's short. Um, you can tell by, if you look on, if you look around the world, what's going on around the world, the wars and the, all the terrible things happening with the land, the floods and. You know, there's like 30 floods there every single month in a different part of the world. And tornadoes everywhere. and Baseball-sized hail and like 30, 20 to 30 volcanoes going off each month. Volcanoes where people didn't even know they were. And many, much, much, much more stuff. And all the wars and stuff. And it's just continuous wars and fighting all over the world. And so, um, you know, you want to be prepared. You don't want to be afraid. That's the thing, and he's trying to teach us and prepare us how not to be so afraid and and um, stand on the word of God and believe and trust in God. That's the main thing is believing, believing in God, trusting in him, you know, knowing him, you know. So um, you can give a thumbs up to the channel if you like now and so other people around the world can get this information, the remnant sons and daughters of God, and uh, subscribe also too. And if you listen to this man, then you probably are remnant sons and daughters of God, for sure. And you'll be used here in the end times very soon by God to do some mighty powerful things. And, uh, he shares all, a lot of his uh, experiences with the Lord. Uh, his first time seeing the Lord, he was praying over a pile of uh, letters. And uh, the Lord actually knocked on the door because he had told, told the staff not to disturb him. And uh, the Lord knocked on the door and he said, come in. <laughs> and he was shocked and he was surprised. And the Lord sat down and he, they both prayed over the, the letters. And the Lord prayed in tears over these letters with him. I mean, physically. So, keep learning. Keep learning. Keep pressing into God. You know, keep wanting it. Keep desiring it. Enjoy this session, and you can check out the playlist. There's going to be a playlist in the um, description area for him. And another another prophet and seer, Neville Johnson, um, has, has same types of experiences uh, as him. Neville passed away in September 2019, but they were best friends. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your holy presence this morning. In the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for gathering your dear children from far and near today. Lord, we have come this morning to present ourselves before you, to make ourselves known to you, to seek your holy face. Open our hearts, Lord. Open our ears, Lord, that we may hear what the Holy One of Israel will speak to us in these last days. In the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. 
sound is very good. At least they made me feel happy on my last day. Sound engineering is a great art, you know. So that young man over there gives us a great hand of applause. Sometimes it's never easy to get it right. Even though you may have the best sound engineers. The unimaginable can take place at the most important moment. It can take place. The videos can go punk. The sound can go punk. So we need the grace of God. Amen. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Esther. Esther, the chapter 4. Last month, when I was in California, speaking for a Chinese church conference in the city of Costa Mesa, I had an encounter with the Lord one day that uh, brought a deep conviction into me and also altered the way how I personally looked at things. On June the 17th, 2015, around in the evening hours, there was a mass shooting that took place at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in downtown Charleston, South Carolina. Are you aware of that? I think this incident shook the whole of America very much. And during a prayer service, a gunman walked in and he pretended to be a seeker of the truth because according to the full report that I read this morning, it says that he entered into the service before the service began. He introduced himself to the pastor and he sat in the small prayer group, prayer Pray service, you know, where, where there were about uh, 10, 10, 12 people. And he sat directly beside the pastor. And after the worship was going on, went on, and when they started scripture study, it seems that he was very argumentative when they started discussing scripture. And then he stood up, took out a gun from his back, pointed straight at the pastor, the pastor went down and then he went on or before the pastor went down one of the church member as soon as he pulled out the gun tried to talk him down and it seems that he wouldn't be talked down so he tried to shield this guy from killing others and that was the first shot that was fired at that guy who shielded him from firing others so when this first guy went down he started firing at everybody else, nine of them, except one. Should have been 11 because another bigger woman and a little girl pretended to be dead. So they survived because they knew how to act dead. Praise God for that. Then there was another woman, another larger woman. This gunman came towards her pointing a gun straight at her, he said, I should shoot you, isn't it? She was scared to say, what, what should she say, yes or no? So he told her, I'm not going to shoot you. There must be someone alive to go and tell everybody else what happened here. So, and every day in the news, all the news networks in the U.S., were reporting these day and night. So, during my uh, lunch breaks, I would turn on the TV to see what's happening. One day, as I was watching the news, suddenly I remembered one thing. You know? Last year, the Lord gave me a word that such a thing was going to happen in the black community in the U.S. So 
So I cried. I remembered. My, what the Lord showed me is coming to pass. Not only in Charleston, but also in Ferguson. Where there was another killing and there was a riots and a lot of massacre taking place. So as I was pondering all this, the Lord Jesus Christ walked in. He walked in and he came and sat beside me on the sofa and he was also watching the news. And uh, he never said any word. Just silent. And then I turned to the Lord and I said, Lord, this is the very thing that you spoke to me that that's going to come, blacks are going to get killed by the white people and as a result, a racial riot will break out in this country and will have a domino effect all over the nation. All that while the Lord was quiet, you know. But the moment I said that, he turned around and he said, yes, I revealed that to you. But what did you do about it? You know, when the Lord asked that question, it was like an arrow of deep conviction hit me. And I became so scared that I had done something wrong. And I immediately I fell down on my knees. I said, Lord, what are you saying? Is there something wrong did I do? The Lord said, the wrong that you did was not to do anything about it. I still didn't understand you know, what, what the Lord meant. The Lord said, why do I reveal of things to come to pass? Why? It is for my people to do something about it. To do something about it. You don't just take the information and you broadcast it and then period. You know, that day I learned something. Actually, a prophet's job is to pronounce what he sees or what he hears. But that day I learned it doesn't stop there. He should do something more. Marshal, gather and provoke the people to do something about what has been revealed. If we do nothing, then whatever has been said will all come to pass. But we can do something about it. Two things can be done. One, if we humble ourselves, fall on our faces, fast and pray, seek the face of God, the thing that has been pronounced can be averted. Totally averted, totally stopped, totally prevented. Or, if it cannot be averted, it cannot be prevented, it must come to pass. Then, the effects and the damages can be minimized. Instead of, let's say, 10,000 people are going to die by an earthquake, and in a 7.5 magnitude earthquake, when you all pray, instead of a 7.5, it can be just 3.5, a small earthquake. And instead of 10,000 people dying, maybe just 10 people may die. So this is the power of prayer. So you save an entire nation from destruction. Sometimes it can totally be averted. Like I've shared with you many examples these past few days, how even the sentence of death was overruled, overturned, when there was an intercession made. So when people prayed, it was overruled, overturned. And you have a biblical example for that. In Isaiah chapter 33, where Isaiah the prophet was sent to King Hezekiah to tell him, you're going to die. Because he was having some kind of a cancer. So you are going to die. So don't waste time going to get admitted in this hospital. Get chemotherapy treatment. That treatment, this treatment. Don't worry. Don't waste your money. Because you are going to die. Since you are going to die, set your house in order. Make sure that there is a succession for your leadership. 
make sure that all your you write all the will perfectly so that there's no squabbling fighting among your children after you're gone that's what it meant put your house in order so as soon as Isaiah delivered that King Hezekiah must be young man no immediately the Bible says he turned his face to the wall and he cried terribly he cried terribly now if you look at what he prayed he did not say Lord why me I'm so young I should not die I still have plenty more years instead of saying like that he reminded God of all his righteousness say Lord in your name I have done this remember this remember that remember this remember that you know the scripture tells us now put me in remembrance right so he was putting the Lord in remembrance and Ezekiah being a true prophet of God after he delivered the message he just walked away he didn't bother to see whether the mail is opened I've always used to wonder you know you know when mailman comes to your house when they throw the mail into your house and then they do this wait for you excuse me I just delivered you a mail open and read it do they do that no in India in the old you know now many things have advanced so much in India but 20 years ago when the mail mailman comes he'll come and stand near the entrance of the house and he'll throw the letters into the house and shut letters and then he will walk away so that is an announcement that there is a mail for you you know but the mailman will not stand there why aren't you reading the letter that I delivered to you does he do it? does he do that no whether you open or you don't open he couldn't care less that's what you do anyway most of us what we get are junk mails right we don't even open them we just throw them into the waste paper basket so a prophet is like should be like that whether you pay heat or you don't pay heat that's not his problem his problem is to deliver so that's what Isaiah did he delivered and he walked away but the Bible says from the entrance or from the presence of the throne of Ezekiah and before he reached that doorway the word of the Lord came unto him go back and tell Ezekiah I've seen your tears that's the first word God said you know God did not say tell him I heard your prayer he said I've seen your tears why did God say that because tears is the result of a broken heart and a broken heart is the result of a humbling heart and humbling attitude so that's what is more important in intercession in getting the attention of God not mere two-minute prayer not simply gathering together and say let's pray for this and everybody shout for 10 minutes done how do you know it's done it hasn't even reached this ceiling about 10 years ago I spoke at a church in Taiwan so there were about 1,000 Chinese believers who gathered at the meeting it was during the Chinese New Year festival so the whole of China the whole of Taiwan they close all establishments for one week so the Christians usually have their conferences conventions during the time so there was this place that invited me and in one of the sessions the word of the Lord came unto me concerning something that was going to happen to Taiwan so I shared with them and said now let us all pray you know I've never seen a people group like the Chinese people who really know how to pray if you want to learn prayer you must all go to China or Taiwan see them in prayer you will learn a thing or two how they take hold of God so when the call was given all these 1,000 Chinese believers came right up to the altar some felt full prostration some just knelt down and they began to cry and they began to beat their chest beat their faces and they cried and they cried and they
and they cried unto God for 45 minutes. Tears were rolling down their eyes, mucus was rolling down their noses, everything was taking place. I'm not exaggerating, I'm just telling you what I saw before my eyes, you know. Because there was this one woman who was very close to me, and she was crying and crying and crying every now and then. She would lift up her face and look up to the sky. That's when I saw all the mucus coming down. You know? See, they took hold of God with such a passion. For 45 minutes, the whole building reverberated with their cries and with their shouts and with their prayer. 45 minutes, non-stop. I, I couldn't do anything to stop the meeting. So I went and sat at a corner, waited for everything to die down. And just as it was just dying down, an angel appeared before me with a bowl. This and he is told me, super powerful. prayer is not Wait. enough. So what do you mean this prayer is not enough? They prayed for 45 minutes. Look at that. The mucus is still there on your face. And the angel told me, come, take a look. So he had a bowl in his hand, you know. He said, look down. When I looked down, you know, at the bed, it was a big bowl, about 15 inches high. And there was a, just a small pool of tears at the very bottom of the bowl. So I asked him, what is this? These are all their tears. I said, that shouldn't be. For 45 minutes, 1,000 people had prayed. The bowl should be full. So he told me, that's how you see. But that's not how God sees. Whatever it is gathered here comes from them. See, it's not enough for bodies to gather together to make numbers. Hearts must gather. You must offer your hearts as a broken sacrifice before God. That's what will matter. When you present your hearts as a broken sacrifice before God, even if you pray a one-sentence prayer, that will fill up the entire bowl. You know, about 15 years ago, I spoke at a church in Singapore for a Sunday service in an Anglican church. So after the meeting was over, uh, some people came for prayer. Among them was one, not middle-aged, in her mid-thirties, woman came up to me for prayer. So I asked her, what do you want? So she said, please pray for my stomach. Okay, stomach means, what is stomach? It was stomach cancer, stomach ulcer, stomach pain, stomach this, stomach that. So many problems are there, right? So when he says stomach blindly or in general, how am I going to know what, what to say? So sometimes I try to ask for specifics, but people don't be specific. They want to be general. Okay. So just as I was about to touch her, her friend who brought her to the front, nudged her, telling the truth, telling the truth. She said, mm, mm, mm. I was wondering what was going on, you know. She said, telling the truth, telling the truth. Her friend is our ministry partner. So then finally she said, Oh, you know, the following Tuesday, I'm going for surgery to have my womb removed because the doctors have diagnosed that I've got some kind of a corruption in my womb and it's going to be removed. So I asked her, what do you want me to pray? So she said, you know, I already have two boys, so I don't mind having my womb removed, but it will be good not to have it removed. I said, okay, so what do you want me to pray? So she said, please pray that the surgery will be successful. I said, are you sure? I thought you said you don't want your womb to be removed. She said, yeah, but pray that the operation will be successful. I said, okay. So I, I laid my hands on her. As soon as I did that, such an 
indescribable compassion came upon me. And I felt my heart break into a thousand pieces. And I prayed, Lord, renew and restore her organ. Amen. So I tapped her, I said, Sister, pray is finished. What? Pray finish? I said, yeah, pray is finished. He can go. I mean, that's all. Just one center. Yeah, that's all. You mean you didn't need to jump up and down, shout and pray? I said, no, that's all. Pray is done. So, as she was walking back, she was mumbling and grumbling. Later on, she confided to me, or she confessed to me, these Indian preachers do not know how to pray. <laughs> true. True. I did not know how to jump up and down like a kangaroo in the Pentecostal style, you know. You know, in the olden days, they have these cars that you crank up. Have you seen those kind of cars? You have to crank them up, and then the car will start. So in some Pentecostal circles, that's what they do. They first, they'll jump up and down in a frenzy and praying in tongues for 10 minutes. And when they're all charged up, then they pray another prayer. That's not too bad. Okay, that's okay. If you want to live in the 50s with a current up car, that's fine. So, that woman simply could not believe that I just prayed a one-sentence prayer. She was thoroughly convinced that this, it was a bad mistake to go up to this Indian guy for prayer because he doesn't know how to pray. So, the following Tuesday was the day of her surgery. And when she was wheeled into the operating data from her room to the operating data, this was her confession from her own mom. She was full of fear. Because in a little while, she's going to lose her organ. She was full of fear. And when they wheeled her into the operating table, she saw all those lights. It's a scary thing, you know. Have you seen an operating theater? Those lights scare you more than the surgeon's scalpel. So, and she looked at great fear fill her heart. At that moment, she felt that I was standing beside her and prayed in her ears. She literally and audibly heard, Lord, renew and restore her organ. She heard it so real, so audible, as if I was literally standing there. And just at that moment, the anesthesis gave her the injection and she fainted and the surgery was all over. Do you know, today, doctors give you a specimen, sample of what they take out from your body, right? For all the money that you paid them, they give you a sample. Okay, this is what we cut from your body. Take this souvenir home. So, when this woman opened her eyes, a surgeon was standing before her and she asked the surgeon, so, how did the surgery go? The surgeon, who's not a believer, he told her, when we cut you up, we found your uterus or your womb renewed and restored. We need not remove them, so we just patch you back again. You see, she cried and she cried and she cried when she heard that from the surgeon's mouth. And the surgeon didn't know why she was crying until she told him what happened that Sunday in the church. And that unbelieving surgeon told her, truly, your God has done a miracle for you. Totally recreated renewed and restored. Only God can do that. Amen? You see, that was just a one sentence prayer that didn't take more than one minute. So it's not, sometimes quantity is also important. 
But what is a quantity if there's no quality? So the quality, the attitude of your heart matters very much. How you pray. The attitude of the heart matters. If your heart is not there, you come to a prayer meeting and all your mind is thinking about when the pastor will say the last Amen and you can go back home to watch a ball game. If that's what your mind is thinking, then your soul is not there. Your heart is not there. Your body is there. Physical body is there. You know, I am a great uh, football fan. In America, I should say soccer fan. So, our pastor is from Cameroon and our bishop is from Cameroon. So, one day over dinner, we talked about football. So, I said, oh, Cameroon has got a very good, great football team. So, they said, not anymore. I said, not anymore. But two uh, World Cup football seasons ago, they were a great team that made it all the way to the quarterfinals. No one expected an African team to make it all the way there. In fact, I was hoping and praying they will, they will win the World Cup. It will be a, a good turn of climate for once for an African nation to win the World Cup. That was because I was quite upset, you know. My favorite team, Brazil, was got kicked out. So since Brazil is out, it doesn't matter to me who else wins the World Cup. <laughs> so, so and uh, uh, unfortunately, Cameroon did not pass quarterfinals to the semifinals. So we were talking about it, and then they told me, that the standard of soccer in Cameroon went down. So why did it go down? That was a good question. So our Dr. Alice Wood told me a very interesting story. She said during the soccer season, soccer was like an idol in Cameroon. They'd rather skip church to watch a ball game. So once your father, no, your father, her father, a mighty prophet of God in Cameroon, was so upset, he said, I curse this idol of soccer in Cameroon and the team will decay. Ever since that word was spoken, Cameroon's country went down. You see, it's a heart attitude. Where's your heart? When you gather together, the Lord Jesus said, no, two all three of you, together, together, I am there in your midst. Now there are hundreds of us in our midst. We are gathering together. Why isn't, why aren't we seeing the Lord in our midst? Why? The scriptures cannot be wrong, right? The Lord said just two or three. There are more than three here. Maybe a hundred. Why don't we see the Lord Jesus? The problem is, hundred bodies are here. A hundred souls and minds and spirits here. That's the question. Hundred bodies are here. But not hundred minds, not hundred souls. There's no one unity. So there's no oneness there. They are all divided, disjointed. That's why we can't see the Lord. You know, I demonstrated this reality of the scripture once in our family gathering. So, my mother and my siblings, we were all gathered for a, just a family worship. So, we were singing songs and uh, before that, my mother expressed a desire to see the Lord Jesus in the meeting. She said, you always see the Lord Jesus. Please tell him that I also should see him. So I told her, don't worry, it's not a big problem. It's one of the most easiest thing. It's the most easiest thing. So we started worshipping. And when we started worshipping, it was like a disjointed thing there. You know, it's not that each one of them was singing on a different scale. You know, one was A, one was B, another one was Z. You know, all the 26 alphabets 
I always sing in the Z key. That's my peculiar gifting. So, then I stopped everybody. I said, look, look, something is wrong here. So, everybody looked at me. So, I said, look, let's do one thing first. Let's calm down. Let's not have any hurry-burry in our spirit. We don't have to rush to in a prayer. Let's calm down. Bring the heart and the mind and the soul into oneness. Let's do that first. Then let's sing. When we do that, then the scripture says, the two or three are gathered. You know what is the meaning of that scripture? Two is your spirit and your soul. And the third person is the Holy Spirit. Your spirit and your soul become one with the Holy Spirit. When it becomes one with the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit will then remove the veil of the spiritual realm. Once the veil is removed, you will see the Lord Jesus right before you. So I shared them with this. I said, now let's do it again. After five minutes, just five minutes, I saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing beside my mother. And I didn't want to say that. I want her to see. After another two minutes, she started shouting, Oh, I see the Lord Jesus! <laughs> and I asked her where, and she pointed at the right place where I saw. And all it took was just a total of seven minutes. Not one hour of worship or two hours of worship. It's good. But the hearts must be united. Heart, the soul, and the mind, and the body must all come together in one unity. If you read Second Chronicles chapter five, there it is written: when all the worshippers, all the singers, and all the musicians were one, there were more than one hundred singers, musicians. They all were one. One. One heart. All the hundreds of musicians, their hearts were united. One. All the musicians, all their hearts were united in one. When they were one, the Bible says, and they made one noise. One. Not 120 voices. One voice. One voice sounded in God's ears. And when there was perfect unity, the Bible says, the glory of God came down in such a thick cloud. Now this happened under the old covenant when the blood of Jesus was not shed yet. I often used to pray, you know, I ask the Lord, if you can bless the people under the old covenant with that glory, why can't you bless us, bless our churches in this new covenant when everybody is washed by the blood of Jesus, when everybody has the Holy Spirit? Why? So the Lord answered my question very simply. He said, the difference is they knew something which this present charismatic Christianity doesn't know. I say, what is it, Lord? I say, one simple difference. They worshipped God in the spirit of holiness. In the beauties of holiness. In spirit and in truth. This is where you guys are missing it. In your churches, you don't worship God in the beauties of holiness. And the Lord went on explaining to me, you know, so I eventually wrote a book called The Art of Worship based on what the Lord revealed to me. And then he said, look at all the songs that are sung in the church today. So I made a research. For one hour of worship, you may sing about 20 songs or maybe 30 songs. Out of the 20 songs, only 1% of the songs ascribe praise and glory to God. 
99% is all self. Self. All self. So that is not worshipping God in the beauties of holiness. 99% is self-centered singing. Make me feel good singing. Okay, let me give you an example, okay? I don't mean any offense to anybody. I praise God for all the anointed psalmists and worship leaders. Wonderful saints who have written many, many wonderful songs. But this is just an example. When the Spirit of the Lord is moving in us, I will sing like David sang. You know the song? You sing the song? Okay. Let's use this as an example. When the Spirit of the Lord is moving in our midst, I will sing like David sang. Do you want to sing and dance like David danced? Go back to the Old Testament. Why would you like to sing and dance like David when you are not singing and dancing like David? Right? You know, King David, he was exuberant in his worship. He was, he, you, you couldn't find him standing in one place. He'll be jumping all over in exuberant singing and dancing. If you want to sing and dance like David, you should do like that. You should be all over this church. Not locked onto one seat. You stand in one place and sing, I will sing like David. <laughs> and you stand like a soldier and you say, I will dance like David dance. You are mocking David, you know. Okay, besides that point, the point is, what praise, what magnificency or majesty or glory is in that song unto God? There's none. If you do a survey of all the songs that we sing, 99% of our worship songs fall into that category. So what glory is are we giving to God? What praise are we giving to God? None. Except for that 1%. And when you get into that 1%, and just as the glory is about to break out, the pastor comes and takes the mic and says, Amen! such a great danger is looming over our, this nation. What are we doing? Now again, I don't mean an insult to anyone. I say this with great love. Shall I speak the truth to you? I say this with great love with a heart of sincerity. All the questions that were written, you know this morning when I was praying and asking the Lord, shall I go and do this thing? He said, for all that you sh shared about what is going to come to pass in this nation, how many of them cared about what they should do for this nation? There was not a single question about what should we do now or what we should do next. All the questions were self-centered questions about their personality. For personal survival rather than the salvation of the nation. So again, the word 
the word of the Lord came in to remind me. This is what I meant when I said, I'm looking for one man and I found none. Looking for one man to stand in the gap. But I found none. But because I found none, my hand will bring judgment. When you don't care for your own nation, who will care for you? Tell me. Who will care for you? It makes a difference, you know, for the sons of the soil to cry than for a stranger to cry. I can pray for you, you know, but my burden will not be greater than your burden. Because to me, I am just a visitor. When I pray, the burden that I have will come from the Lord. But when you pray, your burden comes from the soil of the ground. Because you are part of this land. You are of this land. You are the sons and daughters of this land. You are living in this land. You make your home here. Your children are here. Your grandchildren are here. Your future is here. You must care. You must pray for your safety. When a great destruction comes, for example, Katrina that destroyed Louisiana. Now even the churches are destroyed, right? When the whole city was flooded, all the churches in the city were flooded. They were destroyed. Christian homes were destroyed. Even the righteous will suffer. So why don't we think like that? Don't think that we'll all be caught up. No, not yet. Not yet. Before the catching up, which will come, the church will have to go through the fire. A fire of purification. But before while we are going through the fire of purification, when all these calamities are taking place, what are we going to do? Are we going to just do nothing about it? Let the hurricanes come and tear your homes apart to pieces. You want to let earthquakes come, rip the nation apart to pieces. You want to do nothing and let a foreign army come to invade the US. Do you know this coming? Last year, a ministry called True News interviewed me on the radio. So they called me and we, the, the pastor, Rick, was interviewing me. Before that, I prayed. He said, Lord, I do not know what question this man is going to ask me. It's a live program. You can't say, ah, 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 ah. You can't do all that. Right? If it's a pre-recorded program, you can do all the ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, and we'll just cut and edit everything. Like we do in our TV studio. We cut and edit all the ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh. even when I, when I stumble and I make a mistake in words, my editors are so good, they'll just cut away everything, and they'll make me sound so flawless. So flawless as if I'm a grammarian. But in a live program, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, is all there. You can't escape. So I prayed and said, Lord, I do not know what question is going to ask me. I don't want to be put in a spot and being able to answer. And the Lord told me, I will send my angel to you and he will give you the answers to give him. I said, all right, Lord. I felt very confident now. Not to worry. I have supernatural help now. So while it was going on, he started asking very mundane questions. Where are you from? Where are you coming from? What do you like to eat? This, that, all these mundane questions, you know. And then we got into some serious topic. As we were getting into a serious topic about the U.S., this angel the Lord told me would come and help you. He just walked up towards me. He was standing there all the while. And he handed me a note. He said, tell this. So I looked at the note. I was shocked. Russia will attack the U.S. That was what was written in the note. I said, tell it to him. So I told him, an angel just walked up to me and gave me a note. And he says, Russia will attack the US. 
and he was silent for 30 seconds. Instead of me being ah, 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 it was him now, silent. And I said, brother, are you still around? He said, what did you say? I said, an angel just woke up to me and handed me this note. He said, oh my God, this is the same word I got 20 years ago. That Russia will invade the U.S. And not only this now, this man, Rick, is an American. But there's another man, a Romanian guy called Dumitri. Duman? Dunaman, okay. Dunaman Dimitri. Okay. Now he too received words like that. And there are many people. So what are we doing? You tell me now. David Wilkerson, okay. So there is an impending invasion coming. Please don't think that such things will never take place. Once upon a time, that's what you thought. And look what happened on 9-11. Who would have thought America would be attacked? Who would have thought? No one would have imagined even in their dreams that mighty America would be attacked instead by a great army, just four guys, who took commercial flying lessons, just four guys. And they didn't even qualify completely to get their pilot's license. They just learned enough how to get the plane up in the air, maneuver, fly it down, land it. That's all they learned. They say enough. They didn't complete their course because their intention is not to become a full-pledged licensed pilot to work for United Airlines or whichever airlines. Their intention was to crush the plane into the White House, into the Pentagon, and into the Twin Towers. And I am sure it was the prayers of the saints in America that prevented the plane from crushing into the Pentagon and into the White House that it landed somewhere else. It happened on the Twin Towers that was a sample that God is showing you what can happen when a nation's spiritual guts are down, or when God removes his hand from the nation, what can happen? It was a sample. So what did we do after that? Did the nation turn back to God in righteousness and repentance? No. It lasted for just two or three months. Churches were all filled to the brim just for that small period. After that, everything was back to normal. Now, today, you have another fine two buildings on that very spot where the twin toes were. So everything is forgotten, everything is gone. When your kids grow up, they will never know that there were twin towers. Now they will see new twin towers. Do you really care for your nation? Even though you may be a migrant from Cameroon, now you are planted in this soil. If you are planted in this soil, this is your land. This is your country. You are not an immigrant. You are now a citizen. This is your land. This land is now feeding you. This country is watering you. This country has given you a roof. This country has given you shelter. So this is your country. So if this is your country, then you must love this country enough to give your life for this country. See, that's the question the Lord asked us yesterday. Who really loves this nation? So much so that they will stand in the gap and take hold of God. How many are there? So, when the Lord came to me that day in Costa Mesa and asked me a question, so what did you do about it? I was too scared to answer any further. And I just sat at the feet of the Lord Jesus, put my head on his knees in repentance, and I said, I'm so sorry, Lord. I didn't know that I should do something about it. 
and then he spoke to me about Esther. Esther chapter 4, verse 14. For if thou altogether, for if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. What I am sharing with you this morning and will be part one and tonight will be part two of this subject. For such a time as this. This is the title of my message. For such a time as this. Then the Lord asked me a question. Are the people really prepared for destruction, persecution and tribulation? Are they prepared? Or is it going to come upon them unawares? Are you going to be caught off guard? Are you prepared? Do you all believe in the rapture? You don't? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Which one? That's the next question. Which one? Pre-tribulation -tri -pre rapture? No. Mid-tribulation rapture? Possibly. Post-tribulation? Possibly. So pre-trib is out? Out? Out. Suddenly out? Everybody agree? Oh, I'm so surprised. Okay, anyway, there are three schools of thought. Pre-tribulation rapture is before any tribulation takes place. The, the true bride of Christ will be taken away. Then the mid-tribulation rapture says, in the middle of the tribulation, the bride of Christ will be removed. And the post-tribulation says, after the tribulation, just before the coming of the Lord Jesus, the bride will be caught up. These are three schools of interpretation. So, mid-trip, pre-trip, mid-trip, post-trip. So, whichever you believe, whether it's pre-trip, mid-trip or post-trip, what matters most is, you must be ready. See, nobody knows for sure because with so many interpretations that we have, nobody knows for sure which exactly when is the timeline? My stand is this. I know which one to believe. That's my personal belief. But, whatever it is, what good it is for us, if we, you know all the theology about pre-trip, mid-trip, post-trip, but if you're not ready, you can't make a trip. <laughs> so what's important is, we must be ready. When we are ready, whether it's mid-trip, pre-trip or post-trip, we'll be caught away. Why fight over all these bones? They are contentions, you know. The bones of contentions. Let's get to the main meaty part. The main meaty part is being ready. Like the bride who has adorned herself in a white gown. Instead of doing that, you are, you are fighting with all these churches and denominations. No, this is right. Oh, that's right. When, with all this fighting, you forget to put on the gown. When you forget to put on the gown, your hair is undone. No mascara on your face, no lipstick, no nothing. All you look like you just got up from your bed. Now you tell me which bridegroom will come for such a bride. You know, when you, on the day of your marriage, when you walk down the aisle, the bridegroom is already waiting, right? He's waiting and he's facing the, the, the minister, waiting for the bride to walk down the aisle. And then when they play that uh, piano recital for the bride to come, and he turns around, and 
she looks at someone in her nighty, barefoot, hair all microwaved, and uh, that bride is dazed. The groom will be thinking, what in the world happened to this woman? Right? Has she forgotten that today is her wedding day? How come she didn't get ready? That would be the question, right? How come you didn't get ready? A wise and sensible bride will spend hours, if not days, in preparation for that one moment of her life. Just for one hour service. That's all it will take for the ministers to say, I pronounce you as man and wife. For that one moment, she'll spend hours, if not days, in preparation. Queen Esther, she spent one year in preparation for that one moment of her lifetime. If instead of doing all that, we are just debating, look, what you believe is wrong. And then he says, no, what you believe is wrong. Come on, show me the Bible. So he quotes the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. He said, give me the Bible. Let me quote to you. That's what I once upon a time did about speaking in tongues. I was born again in a church that doesn't believe that. And they had a bunch of scriptures to prove speaking in tongues is of the devil. And I knew all the scriptures like a juggler, you know. And I debated with Pentecostal pastors. And I convinced many of them that speaking in tongues was wrong. And those pastors repented. <laughs> you see, the sword of the Lord is double-edged. It can swing either way. It can cut either side. No, that's not the issue. The issue is getting ready. When you are ready, you will hear the sound of trumpet. Only those who made themselves ready will hear the sound. In 1985, I came from India to do some ministry meetings in Singapore. I landed at the airport at about 9-ish in the night and took a cab to go to the pastor's house. You know, the Singapore airport is located on a reclaimed land on the easternmost part of the country. So as we were driving, I was just closing my eyes and praying. Suddenly, I heard the sound of a trumpet, very clear and audible in my ears. So I turned and looked around where this sound was coming from. You know, sometimes school kids in their band, they'll play instruments, right? So I looked around, and it was still jungle. Sea on one side, and a golf course on the other side, and no school children to be found. So I asked the driver, he said, excuse me, sir, where is this sound of the trumpet coming from? This man, an old man, he turned and looked at me. He gave such a queer look. What sound? I said, sir, sound of this trumpet. And he just mumbled something, the Chinese language, I kept on driving again. So I thought, okay, maybe he didn't understand the word trumpet, I thought, you know, with my Indian accent. So, I okay, kept quiet. After a few moments, again I heard the sound of the trumpet. It was real loud and audible. So I said, sir, this trumpet sound, where is it coming from? He turned and he looked at me, he said, what trumpet? Where did you come from? I say, India. No wonder. <laughs> no wonder you are hearing good songs. I felt so embarrassed by that. And I didn't want to ask him any more questions for the rest of our journey. I just kept quiet. After a few minutes, again I heard the sound of the trumpet. Very loud, clear sound. Pa -pa -pa, pa -pa -pa, pa -pa -pa. And I, I was so scared, I said, sir, sir, you know, better not ask him anything. <laughs> better not. So I just kept quiet. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit told me, listen carefully where this sound is coming from. So when I quieted my 
myself. Then I noticed the sound was coming from far away, out in the sky, not from the ground level. And the Holy Spirit told me, what you are hearing now is the sound of the trumpet that would be blown on that day. There are two of you in this taxi. Only you are hearing it, not him. On that day, only they who have made themselves ready will hear the sound. Not everyone. Not everyone. Only they who have made themselves ready, only they will hear the sound. So that's why I always say, now why fight over bones that are unprofitable? Let's go to the meat of the issue. This was the problem the Lord Jesus Christ encountered with the Pharisees and Sadducees. He told them, you tight kumi, you tight anas, you tight this, you tight that, but you forget the weightier matters of the law. You have forgotten mercy. You have forgotten justice. You have forgotten righteousness. These are more important than mere tightening of cumin seeds and anise seeds and cinnamon. Don't be legalistic. Come to the spirit of the matter. The problem that was then is the same problem today. The spirit of Pharisees has not died. It is surviving, continuing in our churches till today. So when Esther was shown, a great disaster, danger was coming to her people. So Mordecai came and warned her, Esther, you must do something. And the Bible says Esther hesitated. She hesitated. And that's when he told her, look, you are a Jewish woman. Don't think, if you do nothing now, that just because you are the queen, you will escape. Don't think you will escape. You and your father's house will all die. Because they will find out that you are also a Jew. And if you do nothing, you will all perish. Even you will perish inside this fine, beautiful palace. Who knows? For such a time as this, you have been made a queen. So be sure to subscribe to the channel if you like. Give a thumbs up so other people around the world can hear the great news. And um, check out the playlist. Uh, below in the description area and um, you'll get you'll get uh, fresh new videos every single day god bless you guys forever in the mighty name of jesus christ